Once this world was nothing but a barren rock. There was no life, no trees, no grass, nothing moved. It was just a rock. But deep within that rock lived Grandmother Spider. And at one point, she was moved to come forth out of the depths of the earth. And her mission was to spin the web. So she made her way up through the long darkness to the barren surface. And there she began to spin the web. Out of her own being, she spun the web. And she spun and she spun and she spun until the whole planet was covered with a beautiful web. Then she returned to where she had come, and she awakened Changing Woman and White Crow Woman. And to them she gave a mission. To Changing Woman she gave a basket in which were contained all of the tiny forms of animals and birds and fish. And to White, uh, white Shell Woman she gave a basket containing the seeds that would be all of the plants that would grow on Earth. And she told them they needed to make their way up to the surface of the Earth. It was a long and arduous journey. And the only way they managed to find their way was to climb the great cedar tree. And the cedar pierced through. And they came out on the surface. And they saw this beautiful web sparkling and perfect. And as they placed, as Changing Woman placed the tiny animals and the birds and the fish and the reptiles, they sprung to life. And they propagated and they covered the whole surface. And even as she did that, White Shell Woman sprinkled the seeds. And the jungles grew. And the great forests grew. And the flowering meadows grew. And the wide prairies grew. And there was the beautiful earth, completely populated with all of the creatures and all of the plants. And White Shell Woman and Changing Woman went to the top of a mountain and they looked out over this beautiful creation, this beautiful web that had been created. And they looked at each other and they said, it's very beautiful, but something is missing. And they looked in their baskets, but their baskets were empty. And they knew that they, there was something more that they had to do. So they decided to separate. Changing Woman went up to a flat stone plateau. And a white, white Shell Woman went down by a waterfall. We will come together again. The sun came down, and it stroked changing woman and embraced her, even as White Shell Woman was being embraced by the beautiful mist from the waterfall. And when they came together, they looked at each other and they said, we are different. Something moves within us. In a few days, changing woman gave birth to the first human boy child, and White Shell Woman gave birth to the first girl child. These were the first humans. They were nurtured by Changing Woman and by White Shell Woman, and they were taught. They were taught that their mission, when they went out into the world and propagated, was to be the caretakers of the web of life. They were taught songs and rituals that they were asked to always perform in order to maintain the harmony of this <coughs> web. And if those songs and rituals did no more than to remind them of reverence and respect for the earth, their mission would be accomplished. And so the two went out into the world and they propagated the world and for many, many generations, they remembered, they remembered their sacred songs. They remembered their sacred stories. They performed their sacred rituals. And they realized that if they failed to do this, what would happen 
was this beautiful web would begin to come unwoven. It would begin to splinter and to break. So their mission was a very sacred one. Did they always remember? No. Sometimes they forgot. And when they forgot, it became apparent very quickly that the web needed repair. And then they would remember their songs and they would remember their rituals. And for a time, the web would remain intact. Now it is our generation. We are the custodians of the web of life. We may not remember the sacred songs or the rituals that were given to us by the ancestral spirits, but we still remember the mission. And it is up to us now to maintain the beautiful web that Grandmother Spider wove. That's one creation story. The Anishinaabis have some stories that are kind of interesting. Uh, one day the sky people stole the sun. Now if you look at these stories, you will realize that what they are often referring to are uh, geological disasters that, that they've uh, remembered over you know many, many thousands of years. And they speak of them allegorically. And so if there was a time when the sky people stole the sun, we know that this is a time <coughs> when there was very little uh, plant life on Earth, you know, and life was, was a very hard struggle. And another thing that I want you to remember is that for us, the animals are very much something that are messengers, they are helpers, they are teachers, and so we don't think of the animals as something less than we are. The spirit animals are very much a part of what helps us. And so in this instance, uh, Fisher got his friends together. He called in Wolverine, he called in Lynx, and he called in Otter. And the four of them decided to go up and do something about there not being any sun here. So they went up to the sky people, and when the sky people weren't looking, they began to gnaw and claw and claw and gnaw. And gradually, some of the rays of the sun were able to penetrate to the earth. And as they did so, plants began to grow, and the earth began to come back alive. But they weren't there long enough to get the sun to shine all year long, but they were there long enough to make sure that it would shine at least six months out of the year. And that's how we got our, our summer and spring, was through the help of otter, lynx, fisher, and wolverine. But we also recognize the plants as gifts from the Great Spirit. Again, we are speaking of a time when a, a great water had taken much of the life from this earth, and young, one young maiden was survived, and through, five mysterious strangers came, and they appeared before her. And one was tall, and he wore a green robe. And he transferred into tobacco. And one was short and kind of round, and he laid on the ground, and he became pumpkin. <laughs> and the other two became beans and squash. But the fifth one was a very handsome young man who married this beautiful maiden and revealed himself to be the king of the corn nation. And between the two of them, they brought the gift of corn to the people, and as long as the people remember to revere these five gifts from the Great Spirit, they would thrive, and they would live in good health. I think most of you have heard about the peace pipe. It's kind of a symbol that people really don't understand especially our, our white brothers and sisters. The peace pipe, or as we prefer to call it, the sacred pipe, was also a gift from the Great Spirit. And again, if you're following this, you're realizing that we, rec we recognize that everything is a gift from the Great Spirit, and that it is brought to us, sometimes through uh, spirit animals, sometimes through plants. In this case, the sacred pipe came in a very specific manner. There were two young men 
who were out hunting. And they were out on a, a ridge overlooking a plain. And all of a sudden they noticed coming toward them an extremely beautiful woman. Her long hair cascaded down covering her and she moved with great grace. And the first of the two brothers said, oh, she is so beautiful, I must, I must go and embrace her. And his brother said, brother, don't do this. This is a spirit woman. This is, this, is, this is not an ordinary woman. But the brother didn't listen. So he went down and he went out to meet this beautiful maiden. And he embraced her. And as he did so, a white cloud came down and covered them. But in a few moments, the cloud disappeared. And the woman stood alone at her feet were the bones of the brother. The second brother was very terrified, but the young woman motioned to him to come. He came very reluctantly, not sure what was about to happen. But she said to him, I am white buffalo calf maiden, and I come with a gift for your people. I ask you now to go to your people and tell them to prepare for me. I will come in three days. And so the young man went back to his clan, and he told them everything that had transpired, and the elders gathered, and they made ready for the visitation of this beautiful maiden. At dawn on the third day, she approached. She was wearing all white. Her long hair sparkled in the sun, glistened. She was very beautiful. And she came into the, into the uh, enclosure where the people awaited her in great reverence and expectation. And she brought with her from her medicine bag the gift from the Great Spirit. When she took from her medicine bag, she held in one hand a pouch of tobacco, and in the other hand the parts of what was to become the sacred pipe. She taught them that this pipe would be and I'm going to use an allegory here that most of you will understand. For them, it would represent what for Christians is sacred communion. That's how sacred this is to us. It is our, our, our most sacred ritual. The um, pipe itself is composed in such a way that it, it represents the four directions, the four elements. It also rec represents the union of male and female. And the, the tobacco is a sacred gift not to be used at any time except in sacred rituals. It's not a drug for recreational use. It was never intended for that. We were told that at each time that we gathered in, to give reverence to the Great Spirit, we would do so by assembling the pipe, filling it with this very special tobacco, and lighting it, and then offering it to the four directions, to the Great Spirit, and to the Great Holy Mother Earth. In so doing, the smoke that we inhale would be inhaling the spirit of the Creator. And as we exhaled, that smoke would be carrying our prayers to the Great Spirit. And so this is our very, very sacred tradition that we utilize in all of our rituals. A lot of people kind of make fun of it, you know, smoke the peace pipe. When we speak of it as a peace pipe, what we are meaning specifically is this sacred ritual in which we are honoring the Creator and seeking His blessings upon us. The final story that I want to tell you is also a creation myth. It's from the Mayans. You can take it as a creation myth or you can take it as a prophecy. It could be used either way. Heart of sky, heart of earth, hurricane and thunderbolt came down from the empty sky. Heart of sea, heart of fire, bearer, begitter, 
modeler, plume serpent, rose up from the sterile sea. And the divine beings came together, and they said, let us make us an earth. And they did this by speaking one word in unison, and the earth was born. And then each one, through his own thoughts, created what was to inhabit the earth. And out of their thoughts arose all of the animals, all of the plants, the birds of the air, the reptiles, the fish of the sea. And it was very beautiful. But the divine being said, we need to create those who will have voice and who will be able to honor and revere the rest of creation and who will be the sacred tellers of the passage of time, the story of time. So they decided to make people. But the first people that they made, they made out of mud. Now the mud people weren't very successful. They, they, they slouched, they grumbled, they just didn't seem to get what they were here for. And worst of all, when it rains, they just kind of melt it. <laughs> so the divine being said, well, let us try something else. And so they made the wood people. And they took a tree and they carved a man. And out of the heart of the tree, they took the pith and they carved a woman. And the wooden people became very successful. Very, very successful. They set out not only to people the whole of the earth, but they turned out to be great inventors. And they domesticated the dog and the turkey. And they created utensils. And, and, they, and they conquered fire. And so they, you know, they just changed everything. And they walked wherever they wanted to walk. And they took no thought of giving thanks, nor had they any sense of compassion or reverence for the rest of creation. They became very greedy, very avaricious, very materialistic. And the divine being said, we've made a bad mistake here. We are going to have to end this experiment, but when we do, we will do it in such a way that any future people that we may create will forever remember the lesson that we are about to teach. And so, they gave voice and the power of speech to the animals, to the plants, to the very utensils and the, and the inventions that these people had created. And all of this rose up against the wooden people. And they screamed at them and they attacked them. And they said, how could you not have known? How could you have treated us this way? How could you have not respected us nor given thanks? You caused us pain. You caused us injury. You had no compassion. And the wooden people were assaulted by all of these things that had ris risen up against them. And in the end, all that was left of the wooden people were the faces of the monkeys hanging from the trees in the jungle chattering inanely. This is the creation story that is called the Popoval, and it is from a translation of Mayan uh, glyphs. Is it a prophecy? Is it a warning? Or was it merely a story? So I leave you with that thought, 
and conclude this. And if uh, there's anyone that does want to ask any questions, I'm more than willing, if I can, to answer them. And I can bring the mic if there are any questions. Can you explain to us um, all the ribbons and whistles and things? Yes, well, the ribbons are representative of the colors of the six directions. Okay, we have uh, red for the east and blue for the red, west, and uh, the yellow is for the south, and the white is for the north, and the green is for Mother Earth. <coughs> so we, and this is called uh, the staff of the storytellers, uh, or a talking stick. We carry it with us um, as an indication of our station and of what our particular role is within uh, a tribe. And the, the, the role of the storyteller is very vital because it preserves the traditions and the values of the people and has done so for thousands and thousands of years. Yes? Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Were you, um, where you were raised or how you came to um, tell these stories and be who you are? Do you believe in vision quests? I was born and raised in Fond du Lac by a family that was of English background and from earliest memory realized that I was a Native American, realized that I belonged to the rice gatherers because in my own visions I was there experiencing what it was like to gather the rice, rowing a canoe through the quiet waters of the inland lakes without ever having gone there. And in further vision quests, it became increasingly apparent to me that I did have a mission, and that was to preserve the stories and the traditions of people who, because of the injustice of how they were treated, lost a great deal of their culture and are only now beginning, to some extent, to recover it. And so that's, um, that's been my mission, to do that, and to preserve these stories, and to um, remind my white brothers and sisters that there is a different way of looking at reality. Animals aren't just animals. There are brothers and sisters. Plants aren't just weeds. There are teachers and our provisioners, and so, this is um, my mission. Yes. Okay. Margaret, had you ever considered um, <clears throat> going to live on a reservation to be more, you know, in touch and involved um, with your own people? Probably not. Uh, the thing about uh, the Native people is we're the only people in the world that have to prove who we are before we can actually say who we are. And so reservation is pretty much re re uh, reserved for the people that are between, one, uh, well, no less than one quarter of Indian. And since I have no viable proof, at least not physical evidence as such, no, it wouldn't be a viable answer. Um, also, Things on the reservation are a far away from the traditional lifestyles of the people. And um, they're making progress, but we have a long way to go. Margaret, I want to thank you so much for sharing the stories with us. We need to know what you have told us. I would like to know from whom you learned the stories and as with the, the Aztec story, a certain amount of research seems to be involved. So I'd be interested in where you get your knowledge. Well, in the last five to ten years, many of the Native people have begun to write down their stories. And there are some, um, there are some wonderful books available. Uh, there are two that I'm specifically thinking of that are the uh, Voices of Wisdom, and the one book is the voice of, uh, you know, 
traditional words from elders of different tribes, male elders, and the other one is the is of the uh, the women, and um, they are very authentic in what they are uh, relaying to those who translate and put these words down, and um, I have a very good memory. <laughs> <laughs> Growing up in the, the 1950s, um, as kids we used a term called Indian givers. Yeah. And we didn't mean it in a, in a positive way. It, what it meant is it was somebody who would give something and then they would take it back. I'm well aware, but who were the Indian givers? Well, and, and that's... You made the treaties and you took, took, broke those treaties and took what wasn't rightfully yours to take. You tell us that the land was ours, and then you take it back when it was convenient. So maybe that's a misnomer. And Just like the word squaw, which is a, a very derogatory word, and I don't ever want to hear anybody use it. But, but I'm happy as an adult to have uh, discovered a, a professor at McAllister College in, in Minnesota who wrote a book titled Indian Givers, and it's just a wonderful story. It's it's uh, research of all of the gifts that the um, the uh, First Nation peoples of the Western Hemisphere have given the rest of the world. Yes. Um, and one of those the parts that was really surprising to me was um, a respectful democracy. That we think that democracy came from Europe, or Greece. and uh, really the the Iroquois nations um, really uh, showed us how to do it right, That's and right. I, I wish we would go back to that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I, I highly recommend the book Indian Givers by Jack Weatherford. Well, as far as democracy goes, it wasn't just uh, the five nations uh, that gathered on the Atlantic coast. Um, the whole governing way of the tribes was based very much on a democratic system. And, uh, for instance, uh, being a chief was not necessarily something you inherited or passed from father to son. Also, we had se would have several different chiefs within a tribe, each one in charge of a specific type of activity. But also, what a lot of people don't realize, that until the coming of the French fur traders, who had what seemed at first to be a positive impact and turned out to be an extremely negative impact on our civilizations, we had councils of women. And the women's councils were always the ones who made the final decisions about going to war. Once the French arrived with their very derogatory attitude toward women, our people began to forget the ways that we had held and how we had held women in greatest reverence as the givers of life. And you might be interested, I'm sure you've all heard of the Sundance, which again is a very sacred tradition. Now the Sundance may seem, uh, and actually it was outlawed by the, uh, the American government and had to be done in secret until the early 70s. Um, but the Sundance may appear very brutal and very um, savage to people who don't understand what it is. It is only males that actually, the, the females or the women can participate in the dancing. But the actual Sundance ritual itself is only for males and they are usually bound to a cottonwood tree. The cottonwood is one of our most sacred trees. And we have what we call the piercings. It's not pretty, and it seems horrific to people who don't understand what's happening. And they do have to pull themselves from these piercings. But what it signifies is an act of sacrifice for the people. Why aren't women doing it? Because women bear children. Women go through the pain of bearing children. And men, understanding that that pain is great, have 
decided to experience pain in their own way. And that pain is a sacrificial offering, sometimes done in thanksgiving for favors that are received, sometimes done as an act of penance, and sometimes done as an act of supplication that blessings may, be, may come upon, upon their families and their tribe. So that's the sun dance. And again, because outsiders don't understand the significance of it, we are prejudged and called savage. But it is a deeply religious procedure. Anything else? Yes? just wondering if you're um, part of any local communities of tribal people and if so in what ways can the community support that actually I'll tell you what we I have a tribe uh, our family well they're not there anymore the father died they were from the bad river band of Anishaba Anishinaabis uh, grew up in the mission schools had no contact with their real culture came to Fond du Lac to work and earn a living. Uh, other than having some relatives back on the reservation, really had very little knowledge of what their traditions are. Was completely lost through the operation of the mission schools that believed it was their divinely appointed purpose to destroy everything and anything that was Indian in order to assimilate the people into the white community, which never happened anyhow. The other thing I would say is that most people, and I, I went to school with a girl, never knew that she was um, at least half, if not full blood, never knew it until just a couple of years ago, talking to somebody that was married to her son, to this day, this person will not admit to having any uh, Native blood in her, nor will she discuss it with anybody. And so the concept of a nice group of us getting together and saying, oh, well, you know, let's, uh, let's have a meeting in this community is uh, pretty much something that is probably not going to happen. So, and, and as I said, most people that had Indian in them, and they just didn't talk about it. It just wasn't something you went around talking about years ago because you were pretty much considered low man on the totem pole. So, but I was too dumb to know that. So I told everybody I was Indian from the time I was four. <laughs> Peggy. What's interesting is that nowadays it's kind of popular. Too. Now it's and the, it the seems like turned. almost everybody says yes. they have some Native American. Yeah, you get blood. You get the idea. We and and most of them are Cherokee. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us kind of say, "Wow, those guys were busy." <laughs> <laughs> yes, Scott. Um, could you just speak about Celebrate Community? And she was asking about Indian community here. We the have the Brotherton, Indians. the Brotherton Indians uh, out in uh, the um, Calumetville area. Um, they are a group of people who came uh, east with the Mohawks and the Mohicans when there was the great um, relocation of people because of the white settlers coming in and they were pushed more and more further and further west. Uh, they settled here. Um, they gave up their right to tribal status in order to be given, deeded a few parcels of land and um, are now fighting to regain their tribal status. Uh, there was an incredible dislocation of people with the coming of the whites. Um, we had the uh, Oneida coming in also from the east coast and the Menominees uh, granted them land, kind of had their arm twisted by the American government, but they did grant the Oneidas land. But then, uh, with, because of the trapping of the beaver, we, we lost our way big time. 
our basic fundamental commandment was you take no more than what you need, you always give back, and you never waste. When the white man came with his guns and his alcohol and his beads and his pretty cloth, we lost our way, and we became greedy for these white man's goods, and so we began to trap the beaver. And we trapped and trapped and trapped in order to get what the white man was offering us. And in so doing, the beaver on the East Coast became almost extinct, if not completely. Uh, so um, tribes were moving inland toward and impinging on the tri uh, lands of other tribes that were native to the area, such as the Menominee and the Dakota and the Anishinaabe and uh, wars broke out. And uh, so the Dakota were finally pushed, as also the Cheyenne, out of Minnesota and out onto the plains and um, lost their, their, uh, their native territories. So you had all of this, this incredible stew of mixing and dislocating and people being shoved and uh, wars breaking out, primarily brought on when we lost our way. If we hadn't forgotten that basic commandment, we wouldn't have given in to what the, white, the whites were offering us. And so we, um, we're making reparation now. Thank you, Margaret. And I'm sure Margaret would be willing to take more questions at our hospitality time as well. I would like to take a moment before we do our closing hymn to take our offering. Uh, and Judy will play some music, and I believe uh, John will come and take the offering.